we start? Why don't we start with um, the Picatrix? Um, so, you know, what can you tell me about this book? When was it written? Who wrote it? And what was their reason for writing it? Was it a collaborative effort? And um, what's some of the history around uh, around that book? Well, it's it, its Latin name is Picatrix, and nobody's really sure if that's the name of the author or the name of the book or both. It translates from Arabic as the gold of goal of the wise, although my Arabic tutor di disagrees with that translation. Um, and it was compiled in the late 10th and early 11th century and is a result of a lot of <laughs> earlier <laughs> research. Sorry, Sorry, beg pardon for interrupting. Sorry, uh, beg your pardon for interrupting. AD or BC? Sorry. Yeah, all dates are uh, CE, that's AD, Anno Domini, unless otherwise stated. I oh, so beg your pardon. Right. It was at that beautiful time of the Abbasid Caliphate when Jews, Christians, and Muslims all shared their knowledge together and wanted to understand things like medical texts, astrology, also the optics, um, learning about light and science. It was a really beautiful time, probably the golden age of Arabic literature. And this is this is the only book, according to the Elements Encyclopedia of Secret Societies, it's the only book that's a really serious hermetic text. But th that encyclopedia was written before the Summa Sacrae Magicae by Berengario Gunnell was discovered about 10 years ago. One copy is in German. So, sorry, the, the Picatrix, why do you say that's the only serious hermetic text? Why do you say that? Well, no, it's just because when I first moved to this house, my housemate had a book on secret societies. And the first thing I did was went to H for hermetics. And the okay. Picatrix was mentioned in that one book as being a very important text. And it's certainly mentioned a lot in The Moon Zone by Nanad Georgievic Talaman. It's also mentioned in, I mean, a lot in The Moon Zone, but also has passing mentions in. The, the moon zone. Sorry, The Moon Zone was written when? <clears throat> Roughly. Uh, 2020. Okay, so it's a, it's a new publication. Um, yeah. And, and what, what, what did that talk about? How did, what did that reveal about the Picatrix, the moon zone? Well, um, the, in Barden's works, and Barden is like the founder. He's the guy that managed to get all of the Vedic astrology and, and synthesize it and, and figure out how to, to use it as a meditation tool and to how to commune with angels and that sort of thing. And he said, you, the rule number one is you just, well, first of all, you don't talk about fight clubs. So there are limits to what I can say. And rule number two is you don't have any truck with any evil spirits, period. You just yeah. don't have anything to do with them because as soon as you start getting involved in that, it's going to come back on you. We only use our, our energy for good, to heal, to, to do well in the world. However, the I mean, author of the I'd Moon like, Zone... I'd just, like to, to, I'd just like to, to, um, to say that I, uh, I, I believe that to be true, that, that it is important to do always do good where you can. Um, but also, um, I think what what you feel or believe to be good it seems to me um evolves and grows with time so um i mean there are there are maybe cases of people who get stuck in a in a difficult space where they're in dialogue with darker energies and um you know what what um methodology or or what spiritual path um you know, if 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 the Picatrix is involved in this spiritual path at all, or can we can we find for moving away from those dark energies? Well, the, the thing is that the, the the energies themselves from the lunar zone are very complex. So unlike the Earth zone and the Shemham Forash, which is the Mercury zone, all of those more or less are purely benign. So they're interested in things like peace, in healing reconciliation, those sorts of things. They are the, the heads which preside over our affairs and they're actually embodied in planets and, and it all related to astrology and things. But in the, in the yeah. moon zone, they're absolutely yeah. mental. They're like literally <laughs> lunatics, right? I'm, yeah. not, I'm not kidding. Some, one of them is, is as pure as the driven snow. 
and would never have a bad word to say about anyone and would only ever do good. Another one, only one, is completely evil, like totally evil. And yeah. the rest of them, all the, the other 26, are degrees of evil and good. And, and Nanad, when he okay. was in a, um, a meditative trance, oh. he asks one of them, he says, are the angels mentioned in the Pecatrix? Sorry, mate. Sorry. Um, I, I just want to hold you up. How do we come to the number 26 or 28? Well, there are 28 to 29 days in the moon. Uh, cycle. Oh, of course. As, as you said it, I thought it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, cool. Well, that, and he asked on. one of these spirits, he said, are you the same spirits that are mentioned in the Pecatrix? And the spirit said, yes. And he believes okay. the spirit to be telling the truth. So it's not a case of, I mean, as hermeticists, we are obliged to communicate with lunar spirits from time to time. And some of them are a bit naughty. So what, would, what does this say about the eclipse? Well, that, that's a, an interesting one. I guess it might be like a kind of um, sealing off of the energies that it would be more difficult to, to divine uh, or to commune with these beings if there's a, 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 if the sun. I never saw that um, eclipse, but I saw some of the footage and the photos and it looked amazing. I almost wanted to be in California. I, I found a nice image taken, supposedly taken by the James Webb Space Telescope of the eclipse. And... Uh, I put it on my wall and it got taken down by independent fact checkers. So it was such a nice image. Somebody thought that can't be real. You know, let's let's double check to see whether that's authentic. And maybe maybe it wasn't. But never mind. Um, sorry. Going back to what you were saying, um, when you said that um, there's energies that we can't, there's, there's times in, in, in the lunar period where we can't communicate with these uh, higher beings, as, as I think you've described them, or the Picatrix describes them. Um, is, that, is that because they're having a day off? No, no, it's merely my supposition. I, I don't, there's no evidence to suggest that. It's just that it would seems logical that if the sun is sat smack bang in between the earth and the moon, it would be more difficult for us to communicate with beings from the lunar zone because there's this huge, great, massive object in the way. But I don't know. That's just, so it's purely oh. su supposition. I mean, yeah, I think the thing is, is because you're able to back up your suppositions with this wealth of, um, you know, references, I, I just wonder how you respond to the analogy of um, if, if the moon is on the far side during an eclipse, you know, are these could could one argue reasonably or is there any text reference to the idea that there are beings of the moon who who only want who, who need a break from from the, the drama of Earth and they just want a bit of direct communication with the sun? Yeah, well, no, I mean, they actually are not much different to human beings in, in that respect, in that they, they hold a lot of parties. They have very sweet water on the moon. They find it hilarious that human beings only see the material. They, th this has angered a lot of mercurial spirits, but the lunar spirits just find it funny because they, they, when man is only looking at rocks and stones, he's only looking at one small perception which is about four percent of the matter in the universe is actually perceptible the rest of it we don't know what's going on we can't even measure it we can guess well we can, we can call it dark matter um but that's 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 as a working hypothesis um to it, i think that's supposed to describe the uh series of rapid expansion early in the formation of the uh, known universe anyway um that the, the mathematicians had to find a way of uh, working out the galaxial rotation. And so they came up with this theory that only makes sense if you include um, either dark energy or dark matter. I can't remember which. Um, sorry, I went off on one there. So no, what I, are we talking I, I, about? But yeah, I'm just saying that the, these guys, they, they like to hang out. They like to have fun. Some of them play pranks. They're usually a bit like pixies or fairies in that they're a bit naughty, whereas some of the other ones are really quite serious, like the heads of the Earth Zone, 
not all of them um and and they they too like to have gathering they're just like people in that respect um it's it's uh it's interesting yeah i mean i wonder go go on on. i mean i I just wonder want whether um you know these uh, mischievous spirits might kind of uh show up in in the in the woman's cycle um it's very very much related to that um the 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 lunar cycle and there's there's one uh spirit of the earth zone that can actually help and promote fertility and uh teach um certain ways to do with either science so that's the 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 the, um the rotation of the moon to uh, there'll be a favorable time uh to to copulate in order to have a child and there are other things like ancient rituals that you can do um that say the celts believed in that you could um uh copulate at particular times um to increase one's chances of, of conceiving a child right right um yeah, I'm, I I don't have any immediate plans there. I'm, I'm I was more interested um, in in uh, yeah. Well, maybe some of the. I wonder if some of the other gods have have actually different things to say about mischief per se. Well, I mean they're not necessarily bad, apart from one of them, who's jet black. Um, the rest of them are actually pretty easygoing, and uh, they they kind of have a really absurd sense of humour. Um, I could read you some lines from the Pocatrix that I've translated that feature at the end yeah. of the moon zone. But right. So the, the ten, this is from um, a book called On Occult Philosophy by Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa von Nettesheim. And he talks about the same spirits. Sorry, when's his time? When's his era? Renaissance, 16th century. Thank but the Pocatrix um, has a parallel passage um, that discusses the same spirit now we're not sure if he's had access to it probably not because it wasn't until later that the Patrick's was rediscovered it was kept in Poland but um so we're going to look at the 10th one so so he says um the 10th lunar spirit is said to be Algelioki or Algeba Aljahaba it is the neck or brow of Leo he strengthens buildings benevolence and supports against enemies by by being giving um by having been given abundant love so that and then the patrix gives the same name it then gives the coordinates of how to locate that spirit uh within the in between cancer and leo and it said when the moon is in that mansion oh, oh, sorry mate um does it actually give the coordinates in terms yes, of it does. Uh, the cel- yes. celestial sphere okay i'm yeah. interested you know. But um, the different manuscripts have different numbers, so it's very difficult to find the correct coordinates. You have to kind of do it through intuition, and you're um, if we're talking about the tenth symbol. Is that the tenth day after the full moon? Well, it just says when the moon is in that mansion, you should make images for love between a man and his wife um, to bring doom upon enemies and make them burn as though they are in a furnace. And to, make, <laughs> and to make prisons <laughs> containing captives secure and to reinforce yeah. buildings and behalf, uh, on behalf of their completion and for the goodwill of associates and to give them mutual support to one another. So not all bad, but a bit of a yeah. firebrand. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. it just says it starts from 25 degrees, 42 seconds and 51 seconds of the sign of cancer and ends on the 8th degree, the 34th minute and the 18th second of Leo. So that's uh, what it says. Can you, on a, on a, do you have an ephemeris in front of you by any chance? Was that, was that like um, an armorelli sphere or something? Uh, no, well, an ephemeris has... Uh, it lists the position of all the planets all year round. Oh, oh, the almanac. Yeah, I've got one. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. yeah, it's it's currently the only book that's big enough to prop up one of my big bookshelves at the corner. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I shouldn't so, have kept it there, but it's supporting a lot of other books. So I'm be I'll be interested to see. Um, I'll I'll do this later on. I'll look up. Uh, did you say 25 degrees Cancer to 8 degrees Leo? Is that right? Yes, yes, exactly right. Okay, okay well, so, so that's one of them. I mean, it's interesting because if I if I was to, that's one of uh, 28, is it? Mm. 
So, um, if I was to look up when someone was born and see where their moon was placed, um, would I be able to then derive richer meaning from their birth chart? Possibly. Um, it's it's difficult because there's a thing called the HGA, the Holy Guardian Angel, and a, a, an author, fourth century author called Emilianus Marcellinus, fifth century, sorry, AD, um, he mentions in his very long book, one uh, at one point he mentions these spirits that are born with us, that look out for us, that yeah. um, that when we die, they go with us and they give an account to uh, the judges on the fields of Amentep, if you believe in Egyptian, um, the Egyptian afterlife, and, and there would be Thoth. Amentep is, is, is kind of what, like the entry into... The, the afterlife is it like mm. is i'm interested to know i mean you must have read about it what it what this imhentep looks like and and what it feels like to be there well the, yeah there are there are descriptions that exist they call them the isles of the blessed or the elysian fields in in the ancient writings and uh, there's a lot of comparative religion there but there's one papyrus which exists and it shows thoth which is teuthe in ancient greek or hermes trismegistus and he's weighing the souls on a pair of scales with the head of an ibis, which is uh, the, the almost like a kind of phoenix-like creature, um, and so it's also uh, an ibis can also be construed as a wolf, I believe. Um, I mean, it may be that the ibis, uh, at, when depicted in in profile, may have like like these other symbols may have more than one um, interpretation. But doesn't he weigh the soul? against the feather is it a yes that's right feather? yes yeah that's right yeah and and in that um papyrus he looks like a kind of stalk he has a sort of bill that goes down um and yeah it, and so this hga it's possible to work out what your hga is but it's quite difficult you can even ask certain spirits if they'd like to be your hga and they uh -huh. may or may not say yes or no, depending on whether they like you. But apparently we do have one looking our sh over our shoulder the entire time since we're born. And even Socrates had one, Pythagoras had one, Hermes Trismegistus yeah. had one, Rob Bailey has one, I have one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's like, I mean, there's a really cool story. My ex-girlfriend, right, she has a lot of intrusive thoughts and she isn't particularly well sometimes, but she had this brilliant story when she was in the kitchen painting because she paints all over the house and she'd left some food on without thinking and ha hadn't realized that it was there. And then her HGA, her holy guardian angel, came to her and said, get out of this room now. Don't think, just get out now. And she immediately did what it said and she got out of the room and then there was a big explosion and a yeah. glass um, container had heated up so much that it left bits of molten glass you can still see them in her kitchen in the doors in the floor and if she hadn't have got out at that exact moment when her angel came to her she would have been hideously dis disfigured and yeah. I, I yeah so it happens i believe i mean i i i i'm someone who who is working um is working to not work that belief I'm someone who wants to just feel it naturalistically without it being this kind of stoic effort. Um, so I'm interested when when you talk about, you know, um, mischief and these guardian spirits. And I wonder if um, if we go back a minute, just just wind it back a little way to what it might be like when we meet uh, the ibis headed. Is it Thoth? Is, mm. is that the... Yeah. So um, can you describe some of the environment in which in which we might find that thoth, that spirit of judgment? OK, well, I mean, so there, there is actually a description by a guy called Athanasius Kircher that survives. Um, and he he uh, he relates thoth to a particular angel. But this is not a lunar angel. It's a mercurial angel. And it's, it's actually, yeah. A higher angel, judging by how how high you have yeah. reached. Yeah, well, it's only the third zone out, and there are seven zones, but um, or eight if you include the Earth. 
yeah, Deus Salvator, the God, the Savior. And um, I, I can actually, I mean, I'm telling tales out of class by doing this. It's a bit naughty, but I, I can actually find a little section of an unpublished book I recently <laughs> edited. So this, this, uh, yeah, I mean, this is this is who Athanasius Kircher relates Thoth to. And um, there are descriptions of, uh, I mean, the, the angel itself, it's quite difficult to pronounce. It's in, it's in Hebrew, Mahasia, and it's the fifth angel of the Shemham Forash. And it says that this is a very kind and supportive angel. Um, it's not uncommon to hear uh, dramatic music when he announces his appearance. He, he may come riding as a horse. Um, he may come with a torch in a cave. Uh, he may also appear as a female angel, in which case she looks like a very beautiful noblewoman. Um, and <clears throat> it's a pleasant experience meeting this uh, angel. I can't really say a lot more about that. I'm telling tales out of class, but that's from... Uh, well, that's, that's cool, man. Um, that gives me some things to, to uh, ponder. So um, I'll just uh, say again that if you could move a bit further to your right, um, thank you. Yeah, that is, is that better. better. You'll 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 prefer that in the in the final recording, I think. So cool. um, so um, we got as far as the moon, and and that led us down some really interesting little avenues there. Um, I know I'm sounding a little pretentious here in my interviewer voice. All right, I apologise for that. Um, but I'm interested in in what we can learn. Um, particularly with regard to the moon, that it is this crescent and uh, it has, you know, it has this beautiful place in, in the Pantheon because it's our closest neighbour. Um, you know, I, I don't know, where, where does that take you in, in terms of um, the sort of meeting of, of, uh, of Thoth and, and what does that say about, you know, the importance of, of the other planets? Well, Thoth is a mercurial spirit. It is the, the embody of Mercury, whereas the moon, um, there are a couple of ancient texts which describe this, um, if, a few actually, but two in particular which, um, uh, which stick, stick to mind. And they're both by a guy called Plutarch, who is a sort of late first century, early second century author who wrote a book called um, On the Face of the Moon. And he discusses spirits from other worlds and their relationship to the moon. And in another tract called On Isis and Osiris, which I was just reading today, funnily enough, um, he mentions, he goes into considerable detail about each phase of the moon and its meaning and effect uh, on us as human beings. Um, there's even a, a great scholar who I follow, a guy called Manly Palmer Hall. He says that in the ancient mythologies that the moon, the crescent moon, was actually the, the horns of, of, a, of an ox or perhaps um, the Diana's bow, because Diana yeah. is, or Artemis' yeah. bow is, is the crescent moon. That's beautiful. Um, I wonder if you might know of any, uh, any Artemisian poetry. OK, well, OK, I just opened it at another place, but no, I mean, it's... <laughs> OK, so Artemis says, um, right, what you have done is ghastly and chilling. Still, you are forgiven even for this, perhaps since it was willed by Kypris, who made of all these things happen to satisfy her own offended spirit. It is not customary for the gods to interfere with one another's plans. We let each other's wishes run their course. If that were not the case, I did not believe respect and fear for our father's use. Believe me, never have let it come to this, to let him, the most beloved of all mortals, to let him die to my disgrace. As for you, you did wrong, but you were ignorant of what you did, which mitigates your crime. Furthermore, your wife, because she died, removed whatever chance test the evidence and this convinced your mind the wave of evil down on you primarily but i too am affected it brings me pain the gods take no delight in the death of men who worship and respect them but we destroy the wicked utterly we crush them with their houses and their children and that was spoken by artemis at the end and it's a quite it's a drama it's a tragedy so it's quite heavy duty but that's yeah, yeah. that's 
translated by um, Diane Arnson Svali, and, and she's one of the best translators. It's all iambic pentameter. She's really good. That's not a, not a particularly nice cover, though. I don't like um, carrying this on the bus with me. Well, you get some funny looks carrying that around. Yeah, I mean, it's a shame they didn't choose a nice piece of artwork or something, but it's actually a wonderful book. And Alcestis is one of my favourite plays. That's a much more light-hearted play. Do you ever get into conversation with people on the bus and start talking about Euripides and Socrates? Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes if you I meet someone that I know or that um, that is interesting, yeah. I mean, I remember being in the pub once and was just sat there having breakfast and there was a guy reading Plato's Symposium. And I said, ah, oh, that's uh, Hamilton's translation. And he said, yes, it is. How did you know that? And it turned out he held like a doctorate in philosophy and it, it was Ooh. teaching. Yeah, so he became a really good friend of mine. Unfortunately, he's very ill at the moment, mainly because of alcohol. And I guess that's a, a thing if you become rich, because uh, uh, he's quite well off, because um, he does a lot of podcasts for s some people. And he's just drunk himself to death, whereas you have to have that that um, willpower to resist. You know, you, yeah. you have to get yeah. the work done, then go for a drink. Yeah, I think I think that is a good philosophy. I think that, um, you know, having the discipline and the willpower. So um, can we go can we simplify things a little bit and maybe go back to um, some of your feelings about astrology, what you think it's good for, how how when you explore it and you study it, what what sort of things do you gain from it? Well, for me, it's um, it's a different thing. I mean, for, for a lot of people, I've been when I started my research into astrology, when I started translating the Liber Hermetis, apparently the, the Gen Z generations Z or the new generations, they're, they're quite into astrology statistically um, because they want a degree of reassurance. In a world where everything is turned upside down, there's plague, there's war, people are uncertain about where they're going to get their next meal from, jobs are being put out of, of thing because of AI. But even before the run-up of this, there was a surge in astrology because people a degree of reassurance they want to know that things are going to be okay they want to know that the future and some people yeah. use the i ching other people like myself i cast runes but astrology is is always traditionally certainly in medieval times and in the early modern period was a very elite um uh discipline because it, it meant you yeah. had to be literate and a good mathematician whereas the, yeah. the the kind of cunning folk as they were called or the wise women they would they would be uh cater for a much lower level audience the common man mm. he was reserved for kings and queens and people like that people with money so so um you know i don't see that then like when you said earlier um i i tend to agree with you that all religions have something to offer every spiritual discipline has something to offer um, and you said, you know, in your previous interview that you love all religions, you respect all re religions. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't know. I think I think whichever spiritual path you choose, there's going to be an element of discipline. Right. Um, now, I'd be interested to know if the wise women of the village who cast the runes or, you know, uh, looked into the, the tea leaves, were they? Um, what what sort of discipline were they? Do you think they they might have embodied or exemplified? There's a really great lecture by um, Professor Keith Wrightson of Yale University, and he does a whole hour, two hour long lecture on these. And it would appear as though the best evidence we have for these are actually the court records. So when people have brought a, a suit. They, they keep minutes of what happens in the court proceedings. And often it will yeah. be like a neighbor who's complaining about another neighbor. And it's all very low and spiteful and base. But sometimes you get you get. What these people um, got up to and uh, and he, he says in this lecture that that it was part of many children's training, like learning to cross the road, that this was the debris of a mass of, of, of 
low-grade superstitions from various sources that weren't really drawn together in any kind of coherent system. It was the debris of something. So a lot of it, it, it was to do with um, herbs, looking for medicines and things that could yeah. help, and these yeah. would be reinforced with spells. Um, they would be good at curing animals. Uh, sometimes they would keep um, keep animals, like lots of, a lot of uh, supposed witches kept things like toads or, or cats. I mean, one one lady even had a, a pig that was deemed to be possessed. The pig was called Tiffy. <laughs> And yeah, and that's, that's, those sort of things. So you get like these weird, weird things. But it was um, it wasn't until Matthew Hopkins that, that he was really harsh, kind of nutcase fundamentalist that went around just burning, quote unquote, witches just because on the thin, thinnest. And in the end, people got fed up with him and they ended up burning him. Because really? it's just too much. Yeah, Matthew Hopkins, real nasty piece of work. It's a great Vincent Price movie. It has nothing to do with the history, but it's a, it's a great movie called Witchfinder General. And um, yeah, so but so I, I don't think there's much relationship between the wise women. There probably is today, but back then, um, back in Elizabethan England, for example, the period that Wrightson um, covers, he, he said that astrology was very much the elite, the, and certainly Nostradamus was was an astrologer. And um, in, in the writings of Suetonius and Tacitus, you have um, astrologers sometimes being put to death because they've correctly predicted the outcome of of something which didn't agree with a particular emperor um, who would either exile them to an island or, or have them killed. I guess so, it's, you know, Put, you, you might call it perks of the job then <laughs> well, yeah yeah i mean he's <laughs> yeah, i suppose so but i mean, it's uh, it's an interesting for me i i tend to use it as a vehicle for my meditation practice so i'd use it as part of scholarly research and for for the esoteric synthesis of astrology but that's a whole other thing that's more related to the to the picatrix Okay, so um, yeah, I'm interested in that book because um, I get I hear it mentioned a lot when I watch um, <clears throat> uh, Chris Brennan on his astrology podcast. Um, he he mentions that, and he mentions Vettius Valens quite a lot. This guy was a, oh, uh, oh, Vettius Valens uh, was an astrologer. He's not, uh, yeah, yeah. Valens is another emperor um, from much later in history. Yeah, Vettius Valens is an astrologer and a particularly good one. He's um, up there with Firmicus Maternus, with Dorotheus of Sidon, with Ptolemy, with Manilius. There are very many of them. Um, but yeah, Vettius Valens, outstanding book. Excellent book. Okay, cool. So um, what what can Vettius Valens teach us about, if we, if we trace it back a little way to astrology as a, uh, you know, and and kind of explore it a bit more. Um, Mercury, I'm interested in particularly, and um, because I've got Mercury quite strong in my chart, because I feel when I'm hanging out with you, I'm speaking my mind. Cool. Um, you know, and you're a very Geminian, uh, you know, hermeticist, I think. So um, I, I'd be interested to hear what you've discovered from Valens or uh, Valens there. OK, um, well, this, this is this is a quote from um, Vettius Valens Anthologies, book one, translated by a guy called M. Riley. And he know. says it, he says here that um, Mercury indicates education, letters, disputation, reasoning, the spirit of fraternity, interpretation, embassies, numbers, accounts, geometry, yeah. markets, youthful spirit, games. Association, yeah. communication, service, gain, discoveries, obedience, sport, wrestling, declamation, certification, supervision, weighing and measuring, <laughs> the testing yeah. of coinage, yeah. hearing, right. versatility. Mercury is the bestower of forethought and intelligence. It is the lord of brothers and of younger children and the creator of all marketing and banking. It, in its own character, um, Mercury makes temple builders, modelers, Sculptors, doctors, secretaries, legal advisors, orators, philosophers, architects, musicians, prophets, diviners, augurs, dream interpreters, braiders, weavers, systematic Whoa. physicians. <laughs> I mean, I'm ticking a lot of these boxes here. Um, Mercury oh. makes weight lifters. Max, at Max, 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 um, mate, 
again, I'm I'm currently sitting under your nose. <laughs> Sorry, I was reading. I was reading. Um, yeah, I, so I that, that's, that's what Vettius Valens has to say about Mercury, and he goes on. Um, I mentioned it sooner, but never mind. It's it's it is funny because you know you you're you're giving all this wonderful wealth of information, and I'm sitting there just underneath you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I can still see you and hear you coming through clear and fine. I, I sometimes wonder if you might be one of my guardian spirits, Max, you know. Well, I I'm, I'm kind of think you might be mine, actually, because I remember that when we had that party, it was so cool that you rocked up and you were the first person to arrive. And uh, I nobody from the local area turned up. But then loads of people from Bridport and Cambridge turned up and you were the first. And that was uh, a good party. It was a lot yeah. of fun. And uh, as always, when you start playing the guitar, everyone's hearts just melt. I'm you know. thinking of like maybe beneficial outcomes, like the good yeah. things. Um, so can you think of any, I mean, I, I've talked about reassurance and Generation Z wanting a measure of reassurance, but you as a practicing yeah. astrologer, um, what are some of the beneficial outcomes that you've had when you've been giving people readings and interpreting charts like you did for me? Um, well, for me, there's kind of two branches of astrology that I look at. There's the psychological side and then there's the predictive side. And um, I'm much more immersed in the psychological stuff. And that's partly a failing of my uh, astronomical ability to look at um you know the the mathematics of how there's a particular quality in uh, astrology called zodiacal releasing which is um is 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 very precise in terms of calendar dates and um that that specific archetypal energies or multivalent energies come through from these various uh, godlike symbols or symbol like gods um, at very specific times, according to zodiacal releasing, um, but I don't, I haven't quite got my head around that yet. Um, where I look at when I'm having a conversation with someone about astrology, what I try to do is to offer them a an, a more empowering way of seeing their life, um, because that's what I try to do for my own life. I think it makes sense as a as an offering for other people. Um, and so a specific example could be I was in conversation with Chris, who I live with yesterday, and um, we were talking about the there's this thing called secondary progression, where if you take uh, the day that you were born and you move around one day and then and you look at the chart for that second day, but that second day has kind of a, a uh, an undercurrent of um, tone for your second year of life. And if you go through, Ooh. yeah, so if you go through each planet, each configuration, say, let's say you're um, <clears throat> 45 and um, you're looking at your chart you, you would go around 45 days after you were born and you look at that chart and you see how how you feel. And that and that that kind of has a, a it kind of adds a, a flavor or a dimension to the quality of your year as a as a 45 year old, you see. So um, there's there's one particular thing, which is where. Um, I, I expect you know you've all you, you've heard about Mercury retrograde. All the planets do it sometimes, except the Sun and the Moon. And um, what this is is where they appear to go backwards because they slow down relative to our speed of orbit around the Sun. Um, so, if you imagine you're looking along the belt of the ecliptic out at these planets, they they sort of slow down and then they start to go back the other way, and then when our planet kind of comes around the other side of, of the view i think you have to have it has to have gone behind the sun or something i don't know precisely but what what will happen is at some point in our orbit it will appear as though that planet is going direct again that it's moving as it was 
And um, most of the outer planets spend, I think it's something like 40% of the year in retrograde. Um, and, you know, when you're looking at Mercury retrograde, you're looking at um, miscommunication um, and, you know, lost emails and uh, speaking at cross purposes and those kinds of things. Um, and also things like scams, deceptions, um, <clears throat> casual cruelty without without forethought. And forethought is that is that motion of, you know, so some people, some astrologers will, will want to look at all the evidence for that. Um, but I'm someone who kind of just trusts the evidence. I just I've come to accept it. Um, and when um, I was in conversation with Chris yesterday and, <laughs> um, you know, cut a long story long. And um, I was talking about his that, that in his secondary progression that I mentioned earlier, so where he's now 76, so I look at the 76th day after he was born, there will have been planets in the first 76 days of his life, which may have gone from retrograde to direct or direct to retrograde. And those events in life, if you look at the timing of that change from retrograde to stationary to direct or vice versa, then there can often be a, a release for that person or a massive change for that person um, that their whole life takes on a different flavour and or a particular element of their life becomes much easier to live with or much more challenging to live with and um, you know so there's there's that I mean uh, that's a whole I'm, fascinating aspect which I've not even heard about before that's really yeah. insightful so sorry to turn this around I, so I'm the interviewer but this is this yeah, is well, great stuff. Cool. I'm glad you're enjoying it. You know, Very um, much. me too. And I think there's some there's some uh, <clears throat> there's some two way dialogue between these these kind of gods or um, or angels or or whatever they are, um, where the inner planets have this uh, familiarity to us in our day to day life. The, the further out you go, the more peculiar and remote these planets are. So the more strange their qualities. Like I always think of uh, Neptune as being um, very tricky as a, a, you know, as you remember the stories of Poseidon. So um, I wonder if I could ask you a bit about about Poseidon and, and Neptune and, and, you know, what's the relationship there? and because um, I know this is supposed to be at the edge of kind of rational consciousness. It's a very sort of spiritualized planet in in the astrological community, you know. Well, um, it's in it's a case of syncretism, which is when the when one culture adopts the the gods of another culture uh, or any cultural practice and then relabels it and. And, and basically absorbs it. And the Greeks really loved astrology. They were massively into it, and so did the Romans. And Poseidon basically got renamed Poseidon, which some ancient authorities think means earth shaker. Um, and there's a very famous passage in the writings of Apollodorus, and it also appears in a couple of other authors, um, when the gods drew lots, um, and the, the, the three, spaces after the, the war with the Titans and Kronos and Zeus. And Zeus was allotted Uranus, which is the heavens. Hades was Pluto, which is the, means the wealthy one, but it, it, the underworld. And Poseidon was given the, the ocean and he rules yeah. over the ocean. Um, so he, he's, he's actually a very, very important god. He's one of the 12 Dimaiochres or the major gods. And it's no coincidence that there are 12 major deities there are 12 labors of Hercules. There are the 12 disciples. There, there are even um, other things like the 12 voyages of Sinbad, which are thinly veiled allegories for um, astrology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I wonder if um, if you know any uh, particularly uh, with with Neptune is it's, it's the oceans and. Um, Yeah, well, just bang on the floor if I'm still too noisy. 
<laughs> I love it, mate. We were talking about Neptune in the oceans, and then we had to go for a wee. <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly, the ancients believed there was only one ocean, Okeanus, which is the okay. ocean that encircles the globe. And if you talk to oceanographers today, I remember being outside a Latin exam at university and one of the other persons sitting in the exam was an oceanographer. And I was mentioning this and she said, well, that's the way scientists see it today, is yeah, that there's yeah. no such thing as the seven seas. That It's yeah. all one big ecosystem. So the ancients were actually bang on. Yeah, it's, it's quite correct, isn't it? There's, there's, you know, there's the rivers and there's the uh, the water that makes its way through the stone, through the rock. Um, I'm sure it's all connected. And even the, the stars are sometimes, um, and the heavens are sometimes described as an ocean. Not always, but um, they're sometimes d described as, a, as an ocean of stars. Yeah, I mean, I love the fact that there's that, you know, the myth and the and the and the reality kind of blend um, mm. when we're looking out at the stars you know there's there's that feeling for me of like infinite possibility yes you know yeah when i was so, a little boy yeah i remember lying in the park in chidduck where i grew up and looking up at the stars and thinking wow there's so many and it just was this you know when you're a young boy and you look up and you thinking about dreams and the future and it was just vast like a real clear night with no moon no light pollution and I was just thinking wow this is this is amazing yeah really I mean I don't know if you've ever I, I mentioned this um it's, it's not the first time I've told this story to you I think but maybe you remember but <clears throat> have you ever had the feeling when you're um when you're lying on the ground looking up at the sky that rather than being um kind of because we're in the, the near the, the the kind of top third of the northern hemisphere um rather than that we're sort of spinning around but that, that by lying there you're kind of flying outwards into space you know space is rushing towards you um i just think that that seems a bit crazy but it's it feels like it could be true you know yeah, I've had that sometimes when I was on my travels. I remember lying down once and, and almost feeling the Earth's rotation that you could you. It was like I was stationary, but the whole thing and you could almost I could almost sense it. It yeah. only happened once to me in my lifetime. But, yeah, I get what you're saying. When I was yeah. a kid being in, chem in physics and our tutor said that the moon affects the ties. And I said, oh, mate, I said, no. And he goes, no, it really does. Like, it, it, it yeah. genuinely does. And this is scientifically proven, even in text. I was reading the other day, ancient text, uh, said that, yeah, the moon affects the tides. If you read the writings of Vegetius or Pliny the Elder, they say that there's a right time and a wrong time to chop down a tree. Because if you chop down a tree on a full moon, all the sap will come to the surface and it will just be all sticky and horrible. And, and so it's absolutely certain that even on a very mundane physical level, for people yeah. that are anchored in reality and don't really see the supra rational, that there is a good evidence to suggest that the moon and the stars do affect us. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I I think there's probably never a, a good time to cut a tree down, but I, don't get me started on that. Do you know what I mean? There's a there's a new development, a housing development going on in Bridport, and um, there's these big, beautiful trees there. And um, one of them came down recently as part of this, you know, progressive development. And um, I just think, well, if I'm going to be a complete human being, I've got to unleash my anger at some point at something. And that makes me angry. I just I find the the, you know, the reduction in our biosphere in the name of uh, human progress, which is clearly plateauing. From my point of view, um, I just think we're at a level where we can't afford to take the piss like that. Do you know what I mean? But there you go. That, I've got it off my chest. I appreciate you listening and hearing me out on that one. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, there are a couple of books from the ancient world um, of how to deal with anger. One's by a guy called Seneca. Another guy's from Plutarch. 
And I remember being very angry once because I wrote an essay for my master's degree on Hippocrates and Galen. And the tutor was very dismissive of it. And it focused on dreams in the ancient world. It was the whole essay, the rubric was talk about the difference between diagnosis and prognosis. And I did a case study on um, on the interpretation of dreams from the writer Hippocrates. And she said to me, she said, you were lucky to get on the pass mark. And this sent me into a rage because I'd sat there and read the whole corpus of Galen, which is hundreds of books. And they're not in really? English. They're not in wow. English. There are no translations or whatever. And I paid a lot of money to buy a lot of books to get these things right. And and so anyway, I'd, I'd made a very big study of the, the of Hippocrates and Galen in ancient Greek and in Latin. Um, it's in Greek, but I was reading it in Latin because there's a, a Latin translation next to it. And um, and anyway, I became very angry. And so I turned to Seneca and I turned to Plutarch and that just made me even more angry. So I really? found just just playing the piano was the one thing or playing the guitar. And that just calmed me right down, man. And I just started to see clearly again. And I think for different people, but if chaining yourself to a tree to stop a a buzzsaw from cutting it down floats your boat. Well, who am I to say that that won't relieve some pressure and be good for the environment? But the, the building developers will get their way. They've got all the money. They've got all the power. Yeah. I mean, I, I think chaining myself to a tree is is far more constructive. I mean, you don't really have any choice. I don't feel that I have uh, that it would be a, a wise or advisable thing to chain myself to a tree, but I can see absolutely the nobility and um, I would I would listen if somebody did, I would say, yeah, they, they, they're right to do that, you know, so. Yeah, well, the, the one thing that I always try to think before undertaking any action is again from Manly Palmer Hall and it's, who is this going to help? So before I say or I do anything, I always ask myself this question is, who is this going to help? And if it's not going to help anybody, then I just immediately dismiss the thought. And I, I just think, well, I must only do things that are going to help. I mean, this could give you like a criminal record and it may be a noble endeavor. But if you've got a clean slate, it might from that moment of anger, it might not be the most prudent thing for you to do, but we don't know. I mean, there might be a lot of people in Bridport who feel that strongly. There might be a big movement uh, there. I mean, certainly the younger people are very ecologically aware. Yeah, um, I think also that um, uh, one of the great blessings of being younger is that you're less inclined, I, I suspect, on, in, you know, by no means am I speaking for everyone, but this is a horrible thing for me to generalise about, but I suspect that younger people are less concerned with the consequences, generally, that they just get on and do it, um, you know. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the, the, this um, battle between the housing developers, private housing developers, uh, big money, and um, trees has been going on for a very long time. There's a lady in Bridport who used to work as a forester in Milton Keynes, which is where my alma mater, my nurturing mother, as it's called, my university is based. And the building developers is a big building development, Milton Keynes. And she was responsible for keeping um, what was that little beetle that stripped off all of the bark from all of the trees? Um, there was a little beetle back in the 1980s that Dutch, Dutch. Was it Elm, Dutch Elm disease? Dutch yeah. Elm. yeah, yeah. And so there was a law that said that all Elm that came into Britain, which is imported, had to have all of the bark stripped off it. So none of these insects get in. And the person who was the MP for Milton Keynes at that time had made some kind of shady deal with the developers who want to make nice straight lines on their map and they don't want trees getting in the way that they just let in a load of Dutch elm with the bark on it. And then suddenly all of the Dutch elm in Britain was completely wow. destroyed. And it was all because developers wanted to draw straight lines on their maps and not have those pesky trees in the way. Yeah, um, that's really sad. So mm. um, <clears throat> I've, I've got some good news. I've, I've been very oh, happy good. to share that with you. Yeah, Please. so uh, do you ever watch Gardener's mm. World? I, I'm not a green-fingered person. It's the nation's favourite hobby. I should be more. 
more. But okay. no. I tell you what, there's someone I won't say who, because I think it would be it, it might be construed as um, as indiscreet of me to say who. But one of the presenters on Gardener's World has recently moved into um, a house two doors down from me. And um, he is um, he's a lovely guy and um, we've been in conversation with him and he's got some really interesting ideas about how he wants to develop his bit of land that he's got. Um, so I'm I'm really looking forward to, you know, shooting the breeze with him from time to time. And uh, it's great that he he came along to my play. I invited him and his partner to come to my play and they turned up on the first night um, and they enjoyed it. So um, I'm really happy about that. That's great. Um, yeah, and, and it looks like um, there's gonna be some opportunities for me to do more in the way of uh, tree planting around here. Um, just in the next sort of six months or so, it looks like um, <clears throat> I might be taking on a fairly large piece of land and um, and having responsibility for it. You know, like there'll only be a limited number of people who are responsible for this land. It's We're hoping to make it into a bit of a um, shared allotment sort of thing. And um, we're going to put a big pond in, or that's that's what I hope we're going to put a big pond in, um, which we've got some great crested newts here. So they'll have somewhere else to explore and to play and migrate to. Um, and the thing with, with great crested newts or any newts, I think, is that if you put rocks around the pond, then they've got somewhere to hibernate in winter. So I'm really looking forward to getting involved in that. I did um, make a, a pond once and it was backbreaking work and I was worried about all the excess water um, of where the and it might soak up and inundate the land but the guy said trees that actually yeah. the, the, the trees that are, are, are next to it they will soak up all of the excess water and just flourish so trees yeah. are probably a really good idea as well as rocks I should imagine yeah this this piece of land that, that we're looking at is um, has already got some silver birch and they're young as well they're um no more than 20 years old so they're about 15 16 foot tall and um they're looking lovely and they're having they've still got some of their seeds hanging from last year even after all the wind and the rain um and uh there's crab apple and there's uh cherry blossom there's lots of rose bushes um and there are there are places in it where you can actually plant the trees in lines if you want to delineate whose patch is whose. And that seems a much more naturalistic way of dividing land up, um, you know. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to helping out with that. I suppose um, one thing you've got to be conscious of is the shade, because I had a friend of mine whose garden I was working for and he wanted to keep all of the trees on his land but he also wanted to grow things and he couldn't yeah. have both. He could yeah, either exactly. have the trees or grow things. So I guess um, uh, <clears throat> a, a reasonable amount of trees, not an excessive amount might be, yeah. might be good with that. Absolutely. And um, also um, planting along the eastern edge, planting taller, thicker trees along the eastern edge rather than the southern edge, because the southern edge is the area where more sunshine comes from. So, um, yeah, there's that to bear in mind. <clears throat> there, there's um, a lovely story I heard of, of a, I mean, I'm to go off on a tangent, but it's an ex-girlfriend of mine, uh, Josephine Illingworth of Suffolk, really beautiful girl. And um, she, she was like... Full name. Yeah, she's really nice. And we went to Spain together, but she she was very teetotal, very intellectual, not into sort of drinking or smoking or anything like that. And she said to me once, um, oh, I can talk to trees. And I said, you crazy girl. What do you mean you can talk to trees? And she goes, no, they, they actually talk back to me sometimes. And I, I was completely astonished by this, this vegetarian teetotaler. So obviously compost mentis from good family. Um, and I believe she was telling the truth. And I, I told this story at a gig I did with Andrew Dixon for a writer in Bridport about 20 years later. And the woman. Well, that was I know Andrew. I've, I've met him 
hung out a few times. He's a nice Lovely guy. bloke. Lovely bloke. And anyway, the woman next to me at the dinner table, I told this story and she said, oh, that's funny because I can talk to trees and they talk back. And apparently she'd been on a like a, a pagan goddess retreat with her daughter and they were making magical wands. And the first thing you do whenever you make runes or wands or anything is you ask the tree if you can take a branch and ask nicely. And she asked and the tree just went, no, you can't chop my arm off. <laughs> yeah. And, and and so, you know, I think it is possible, maybe not with everyone, but if you spend enough time around trees and you, you're really in the zone, that, that maybe you, there is some kind of communication that we're, we're, we're missing. They're called hammer dryads in the ancient world. Um, this thing about uh, being in, involved with this theatre troupe was when we were acting, um, there, there was this, although we all knew the script really well, there was so much subtext, there was so much that we weren't saying, but we all kind of knew. And there was this really interesting feeling that, that I think each person had in a different way, that their character, when, when, you, when you get involved, you know, the character kind of finds you as well. It's a two-way process. Wow. So, yeah, you're, you're tapping into the emotional uh, or imaginal realm, and it's, it's talking back to you. It's coming back at you and saying, yeah, well, we've got some interesting lessons for you or, you know, this is how we'd like to see you change and all that kind of stuff, you know. It's definitely there. I mean, that that's one of the, the really big things. Um, I remember far from the Madden crowd when I was in that and even before that, a, a very successful actor from Mexico came to visit me and she put me on the spot and she said, okay, just do your thing. And I just clammed up. And then when I was on the <laughs> film set, when I was on the film set, um, and they had the camera on me and they said, OK, just do your thing. And I climbed up even worse because I thought millions of people are going to see this. And I just I need to, if, to get some kind of state training. But one of the things that really helped me was role play, because it is a kind of a thespian, not so much the rules lawyering and the dice rolling and that stuff, but getting into character. Yeah. Interesting that we, but the character teaches you that if you're researching yeah. a role, that you kind of uh, you get something from it. Um, it's not just a one way process. Um, and there was a, there was a time when I would have been really really uncomfortable doing something like this, um, but because of the people that I was doing it with, um, I mean they were all stars in in that in that nexus. You know we were all shining, and um, there was some some wonderfully bright moments, some real humour. Um, and you know, I was so glad to get involved and do that. And and it was a big bonus when we when we made some money for charity. I was very happy about that. Um, that was really good. We made two thousand pounds for the Samaritans, and uh, yeah, I was chuffed to bits about that. Wow, that's great, man. Yeah. And do you think it'll lead anywhere? I mean, is, is you're going to um, do another performance with the same troupe? Um, I, I love Valerie, the director, to bits. I think she's wonderful, but um, she and I have quite a sparky relationship. And okay, she used to teach drama over at Beminster, and I think she's had an interest, a passion for theatre since she was about 15. And she's written loads and loads of plays. And um, the previous play that I was in, the Magdalene Whitewash, which um, also had. Uh, Rebecca Danachik, who was brilliant in that as well. Um, I don't know if you saw the YouTube link to my play, the recent one, but um, Rebecca was playing Algernon Moncrief, Algie, my my uh, estranged brother, in and and she's the one who sings um, only make believe, and uh, yeah, she was a lot of fun to rehearse with, and she's got a great range. And uh, I mean, they, they've all got some really interesting skills, that crew. Um, Gwendolyn Fairfax, Immy, she's, she's very uh, full of beans, full of energy, full of life. And, and uh, she, she really makes people giggle when she, when she plays up to expectations. It's, it's wonderful. Um, yeah, so they're all a great crowd. Um, and I'd like to be involved with, with something with them, but after having done that play, I'm I'm quite happy to step back and and just let it, you know, let it drift for a while, <laughs> let it 
float out on the ether for a bit, you know. But other than that, no, no immediate plans, really. Cool. Cool. I mean, I, I'm looking at becoming more of a playwright, but that's a very different target to attain. Like I've written my first play now and it's taken me a long time. It took me two years to, to pen that. Is and, this the uh, one? Sis, did you say you'd written one about ice? Oh, it's a Bodicea. Bodicea, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. The, the, that's about I, everything I'm reading about it. I mean, it's what a TV show I absolutely love called succession and um one of the characters in it she's a playwright and they've got all this money in the world and she just can't make it work and there's even a book i have on economics that i'm reading and there's one guy in it, a guy called larry height and he's exceptional on wall street and he's the only person to have become a successful playwright and then go into wall street normally people go to wall street so that they can indulge in hobbies like becoming a playwright Sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah. I think it'll be very tough, especially in the post COVID era. Apparently, there's a big push to try and get people back into theatres um, because people feel uncomfortable about sitting in confined spaces, which is a bit weird because that's kind of past now. We've got herd immunity. So uh, I'd like to very much like to get involved in the theatre, but certainly from a playwright's perspective. But I understand well enough that I'd have to get my finances in order. Uh, the one time I wanted to put on a play in Cambridge, I met a guy who put on plays. He said, oh, I'll have £30,000 in order to, to put... I know, it's crazy. <laughs> so, you know, we'd so be too loud. Act, what's her acting style like? Is she like Tilda Swinton or Elizabeth Marvel or, or, or Gal Gadot? Ah, ah, what a great question. Um, I mean, um, I'm always... I'm always... I'm very fond of uh, Dame... Judy Dench, and I think mm. you know, if I had to, I would, I would characterise her as as you know, she's playful, and mischievous, and uh, she knows how to hold people's attention. So, <laughs> yeah, that would be that would be my first choice, you know. Um, but why don't you come down, you know, around the summer sometime when it's okay, still nice and. Warm. And uh, we'll put you up for a couple of nights and um, you can meet Valerie. You know, um, I would love that for you. I may even bring a copy of my play. Like, yes. Written out, written out yes. by hand. Yes. That, that oh, like... one, one of yours with, <clears throat> with all the beautiful florid handwriting. OK, but, well, just the one. that's cool man. yeah just a handwritten one i mean i was going to send it to um the royal shakespeare company in stratford say that again but i was going to send it to the royal shakespeare company in stratford upon avon well that's that's an interesting uh yeah i don't know how would you get on how do you think you'd get on well i have a friend who's a poet and she goes there because she lives near there and she goes there and recites some of her poetry and they really like her and she's like a kind of thick northern accent very tough woman and her poems are very about lesbians and stuff like that and i don't really kind of resonate with that kind of poetry but they seem to like it enough and i thought crikey if that's the standard then that's no, a very I'm, low bar no no it's i mean it's you, everyone has their own bar so yeah and she's you, got a different style if you go along and um and you do some some you know to to this place in Stratford is that is that the um the round the the Shakespearean Stratford on Avon yeah is that, yeah that's yeah. like the big one you know where they, the other the, one would be the the Marlow Society in Cambridge but I'm not sure they would appreciate it they might do they might do well I I, I bet they would I, I I remember hearing when you were talking to Will and you were doing your beautiful beautiful poem from Bodicea and I love that I thought that was really beautiful so um you know for what it's worth take that along to Stratford and see how you go so I'm glad you liked it um honestly Rob that's that's really cool yeah man. <sighs> because it's it's like my favorite uh, thing is writing poetry and writing plays I, I'm working on uh, um one at the moment and it's like today I heard a lovely quote from an old army guy and he, he was a navigator for the SAS. And when he retired, he ended up on the ocean um, sailing a lot. And the analogy was that 
out in the desert in North Africa, things are so vast and empty that for him it wasn't much different. Even though he's on a moving ocean, it's still like yeah. that kind of. And it was such a beautiful thing. I actually wrote it down in my notes that I want to use this as an analogy because it was, uh, and it's from a very unlikely source. You know that you would. I, would it be all right to read a tiny bit of Bodice? Oh, um, yeah, yeah. There we go. Yeah, there's a nice. Yeah. Here's a nice section. Okay, so this is the start of Act Three, Scene One, and it's in a glade in East Anglia. And the narrator comes on, who's dressed as a mythological character, and says, As cold Selene, that's the moon, skims off her borrowed light, and clouds drift past Diana's crescent bow, so Rome marched on one seditious outpost, an island home to Britain's sacred groves, Whence shades from Hades' hollow vaults below are raised by the ministers of Cronus that sleeps there in a rocky cave whose walls shine like burnished gold, where almighty Zeus contrived this prison for time's harvester, where birds fly, offering glimpses, portents of future events and visions are seen, the voices of the gods, omens and dreams. You're the new Shakespeare, no question about it. Thanks, man. Yeah, it's not the first time somebody said that. Gotcha. Um, I hope we catch up again soon. And okay. I'm, I'm really looking forward to coming down again to see you around the end of May. OK, great. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Brilliant. Please do. All right. Thanks, Rob. Thank you very much for your time. OK, we'll see if we